Welcome to the BioBalance HealthCast, episode number 531, Knowing Your Own Sexual Anatomy and Sexual Sensitive Areas, part two. BioBalance Health features conversations about anti-aging medicine. Your host is Dr. Kathy Maupin, Medical Director of BioBalance Health and a leading expert in treating the symptoms of aging. Dr. Maupin and Brett Newcomb are the authors of The Secret Female Hormone, the seminal work about testosterone replacement therapy for women, and Got Testosterone, a book that helps men choose the most effective and safe form of testosterone replacement. These books are available on Amazon or from Dr. Maupin's office at BioBalance Health in St. Louis and in Kansas City. Dr. Maupin's office is currently accepting new patients. Welcome to the BioBalance HealthCast. I'm Dr. Kathy Maupin, and today we are going to talk about female anatomy. I will have some illustrations, so if you're just listening to this, you may want to look at the video for the illustrations that uh, we put up so that we make this easier to understand. So I'm always, I'm always amazed at the lack of information women have about their own body, and I'd like to describe the anatomy of the of the female pelvic organs, kind of the the world of the gynecologist, um, in terms of the area on the outside of the vagina, which is the perineum, the skin, the labia, that that area, and then go to the vagina and from the vagina up into the cervix, and then the area inside the abdomen where the rest of our pelvic organs are located. So I'd like to to proceed that way and also note, even though I'm not going to talk about neurosurgery, neuroanatomy, that the brain is the most sexual organ that we have. And the brain can be sexually stimulated just by talking and just by sharing information, even over the phone. You can have an orgasm over the phone if you are talking to the person you love and to the person who you have a relationship with. So the brain is the key to sexual response. But the anatomy is very important, and it's very important to know the names of your own anatomy so that you can help direct your lover on where to go, what to do, the things that you like, the things that make you happy. And this should be shared both ways. He should be able to say the same thing and be able to direct you on the things that he always fantasizes about or has always wanted you to do and ha- and you haven't. So this is an open communication, not just a, hey, do this, which never works, or you've never done this and I want this. That never works either. <laughs> it is more of a helpful education. Like, have you ever thought of doing this? And like mm, oral sex with my clitoris or, you know, there are some, some women I've talked to who have said, I just told my husband I can't have sex without five to 10 minutes of oral sex first, because I'm just not going to get into it unless you do that. So, I mean, that's something you could say in a nice way to your partner. But to do that, you have to know what you're talking about in terms of where you want or what you want. So the be- the beginning of this is the area called the perineum. And If you're in the lithotomy position, which all women know is like the knees up kind of position and your gynecologist is down here looking at your bottom, that's the lithotomy position. So the illustration I have is a bottom of a woman in the lithotomy position. And um, you can see the first and most important organ in the perineum is the uh, clitoris. And the clitoris is a... I guess you'd call it a tiny penis if you wanted to to describe what it does. It is very sensitive. It can it has the um, it's the most popular area to stimulate someone into an orgasm, either tactilely with fingers with the with a penis or with your uh, with oral sex. So that is a very important area to know where it is, and you can see that it's it's on the very top, the clitoral hood goes over the uh, clitoris so that it is protected when you're wearing clothes, so that it isn't rubbed all the time and made raw because it's very sensitive. So generally when you're, um, when you are being stimulated, your blood flows to your, to your perineum and everything swells, including the clitoris. 
and it can get longer, just like a penis would, and it can get harder, and that actually prepares it for stimulation. So that is, the hood actually will come back away from it when the clitoris becomes hard. So that's normal. That's not an abnormal thing to have happen, and it doesn't mean you're a man, which some people have asked me. Um, so if you go from the very top of the picture down, you'll see that the next thing you come in contact with is the urethra. And the urethra is the opening uh, from the bladder to the outside of the body. And the bladder sits back inside your abdomen, but this goes to the outside. It's very sensitive. It is an area that um, you can feel discomfort if it's rubbed too much. It can actually cause it to be inflamed. And um, it's very important that you urinate before and after intercourse so you don't have bacteria travel up that urethra and cause you to have uh, an infection. We all have bacteria all over our bottoms. It's normal, but it's not normal to have bacteria in the, inside the bladder. So that's why we have to urinate before and after because it's right next to the clitoris and it's getting a lot of um, friction when you have intercourse. The next thing uh, that you can see are, and is not really illustrated in this picture, are two tiny little openings on either side of the urethra. They're called para, paraurethral glands. And those little openings have lubrication in them. And for the women who do ejaculate, and women, some women do ejaculate, that's where some of the fluid comes from. So the glands that lie behind them actually contract and squirt the fluid out through those two little holes. It looks like you're urinating, but you're not because it's not coming from the urethra. It's coming from these tiny little glands on either side. So that's what they're responsible for in terms of um, when, when you're having sex. So the next area you come to is the vagina, the vaginal opening. And the vaginal opening is usually about um, two finger breaths, two and a half centimeters um, in size, or in o the opening is in um, diameter. And that is, it can be larger than that. The opening can be larger with childbearing, especially if you haven't had an episiotomy because it gets stretched. So some people who have had lots of kids and who have not gone back to normal, their elastic tissue hasn't just come right back, uh, will have to have surgery to have that made tighter so that they can feel intercourse. It's not just for their husbands, it's for them too, so that they can then have um, um, stimulation and feel the stimulation from having um, penis-vagina intercourse. So, so that is the next area. Around the vagina are two sets of labia. There's the hairy labia, which is uh, basically, um, it's like a pad that protects the vagina. It takes the, um, it absorbs the uh, trauma or the, or the pressure of intercourse. And that area usually does swell quite a bit before intercourse when you're being, when a woman is being stimulated. The labia minora, let me have a word about this. Labia minora can be anything from a very thin uh, lip to a very large lip, depending on your heritage. What the labia minora was meant for was to elongate the vagina to accept a uh, larger penis. So if you have that inheritance, it is not ugly, it is an adaptation so that you can handle a larger penis than somebody who has very tiny or small la uh, labia minora. There is a fad to trim the labia that has something to do with porn that I don't understand, but it is something that people feel is beautiful. I'm not sure if men find it that way or if women themselves find it that way, but um, many women feel that they have to have their labia made smaller. If you do that, you're going to lose a lot of sensation because there are many sen sen <laughs> sensing nerves there, and by trimming them or making them smaller, you're not going to have as much sensation there. So that is not necessarily great for sex. It may be great if you're a 
perineum model or something, but it's not great for um, feeling sex. So that's my little spiel on how I feel about labia minora. <laughs> um, uh, plasty, they call it labiaplasty. Then as you, you follow the area back, there's a little area in between the vagina and the uh, anus, which is kind of a no man's land, but it's an area that does have a lot of um, nerves and oftentimes is um, very, has a lot of sensation. Some women like that sensation, some don't. And then last but not least is the, uh, is the anus, anal opening to, to the um, rectum. So that area has a lot of nerves and those nerves can be stimulated by, um, by touching that area or, or even penetrating that area, but I'm not going to go into that at this time. That's, that's for an, another type of lecture, and I'm, I don't think that that's necessary for this lecture but, uh, or this talk, but I think that you have to know that the area around the anus and inside actually can cause another kind of or, or produce another kind of orgasm. So that's the outside of the perineum. All those different areas have different nervous innervation. These nerves go to different parts of your spine, which I find really interesting. It's, it's like a backup plan. If one set of nerves is damaged with childbearing or with trauma, then another set of nerves takes over for a different area on that perineum so that you can still feel stimulation. And it goes to a different part of your spine. If you have a spinal injury, then there are different levels of innervation to, all, to the perineum, to the cervix, and to the uterus. So all of these nerves are actually uh, redundant. In other words, back, a backup system. So you will always have some kind of sensation unless you have a, a complete thoracic um, uh, division of your spine. But that's, that's one of the most important things that we do is, is have stimulation so that we like it, so that we'll go back and have the risk of childbearing for, to, to keep our um, human race going. Because if this wasn't pleasurable, then no one would have babies because no one would have sex. So because you think, oh, my gosh, I've got to have a baby. Are you kidding me? Because it's, it's not always the most amazing thing in the world. Sometimes it is. But, uh, but back in the caveman days, it had to be really fun and produce endorphins in your brain and make you feel good for women to come back for more, af especially after they've had one child. So uh, endorphins have kept our human race going. Uh, through or orgasmic function and stimulation of all of these different areas. So now we'll go to the anatomy of the vagina, which is, um, oh, maybe four to six inches long, depends on how many children you've had, um, how well you came back from having those children. And the top part, if you're in lithotomy, remember, the top part of the vagina lies uh, on top of that, the roof of the vagina, we'll call it, is the bladder, and below the, the bottom part of the vagina is the rectum, and the sigmoid colon comes off from there. So the vagina itself has a very thick uh, epithelium. It's a very thick kind of skin that thins out with menopause, another reason why you need estrogen and testosterone to keep it thick. But it, it has rugae, and rugae are kind of like... Um, the, the ripples in um, a slinky so that it can, it can stretch. So if you just look at it at the vagina through a um, speculum, like what we did when, we, when I was uh, strictly a gynecologist, we'd open a speculum and you could see the rugae, uh, the little folds in the vagina, as you can see in this picture. And at the very top is your cervix. And the cervix is important. Many times it's removed with hysterectomy which I try not to do just because there are specific nerves that go into the cervix that actually give you a different kind of orgasm. So if the cervix is moved side to side or if it's moved back and forth, then that can stimulate another, uh, the orgasm of deep penetration is what they call it. 
So those nerves should remain. So if you have a hysterectomy, my, my preference when I was doing hysterectomies was to leave the cervix and take the uterus off because the uterus is in the abdominal cavity and then close up the opening from the cervix to the abdominal cavity. And then that maintained those nerves and that maintained that type of orgasm for my patients. So the vagina has an end. It doesn't, it, except for the tiny cervical opening, it doesn't go into your abdominal cavity. A lot of people would come into my office terrified because they lost their tampon. And besides being embarrassing and for them because they wouldn't, didn't, either didn't want to touch themselves or just couldn't find it with their fingers, they thought that it actually went from their vagina all the way into their abdominal cavity with their bowels and that it was floating around in their abdomen. And they were terrified they'd done something that was going to require an abdominal surgery. But, and they were relieved when I would be, I, I could just put a speculum in and, and use an instrument and retrieve it and take it out and that it didn't go into their abdomen. I try to explain that to them, but, but it's very important to know that it's like a, a cave or a blind pouch. It doesn't enter your abdominal cavity. There's no way to get in there. You can get through the cervix to the uterus, but the ut uterus is, uh, kind of a closed system. It has little tiny openings to the fallopian tubes so that the eggs can come down. But it do, it's not just open so anything can pass through to your abdomen. And that's very important to know. The third, the third anatomical area is inside your abdomen. Your cervix crosses between the vagina and the abdomen. And then at the top of the cervix is your uterus. And beside the uterus, the uterus is usually about this big if it's not pregnant, and beside the uterus, and it falls, falls down, but behind the uterus usually are your two ovaries. And when you're fertile, before menopause, they're usually about that big. And they have a, the tube is attached to the ovary so that it's not floating around somewhere. It's attached to the ovary, and it feeds the eggs, float around, and get into the fallopian tubes, and then they get into the uterus and then they are, they are uh, fertilized inside the uterus, or they're not, or they just dissolve. So that part is inside your abdominal cavity. So when I'm checking, or your gynecologist is checking you, she will put at, in lithotomy position, so you still have your knees up, your feet are in stirrups, she will have a gloved hand on your abdomen and two fingers in the vagina, and she can feel the size of your uterus and she can feel the size of your ovaries. So she can tell whether you have fibroids, ovarian masses, if you have anything that's abnormal, it will be large. If you're menopausal, the uterus shrinks down to a tiny little thing and the ovaries can't even be felt. They're usually so small, they're just like, they're like little tiny ropes. They don't even feel like ovaries. So what she's feeling for when you're postmenopausal if she's feeling for bad masses or dangerous masses like ovarian cancer. So that's why you go to the gynecologist, not just for a, a pap smear. You go to make sure you don't have any masses in there. Now, if you've had a hysterectomy gen and you haven't had any abnormal paps, then after 65, you really don't need to go. But before that, you do. If you've had a history of ovarian cancer in your family, you still need to go even after 65, just to have be palpated or to, to be have your ovaries felt for an enlargement. So that's those are the names of all the parts of your anatomy. The um, cervix is attached to the uterus and can be is it does push the uterus up and back when you're having intercourse. So it is if you don't have a uterus but you still have a cervix, it feels like you have a uterus. It still has that phantom feel that your uterus is still there. But I just want to make sure that you understand that why we do these exams, it has nothing really, it's not about sex, it's about health. And the different things that we look at when we're looking at pelvic anatomy. What I wanted to give you the names for these different things and the location is basically so that you can... Um, Discuss this with, with the man that you're having sex with. 
even if you've been married 20 or 30 years, you can still have this discussion using the proper words or showing him what area you want to have stimulated, how you want to have it stimulated, what kind of pressure you want every woman as an individual. There's not one woman that's built exactly the same. We just have the general same anatomy, but it's not exact. So we are still all individuals, and we all still have different wants and needs. So it is important for you to know the names of these things, where they are, and to feel safe about the vagina not entering your, not having an opening into your abdominal cavity or true opening. Um, so you don't f worry about something in the vagina traveling somewhere. Um, I guess an aside is if you have an IUD that's inside the uterus, you have to put it past the cervix into the uterine cavity. So the only thing that you can see from an IUD is a little string that comes out of the cervix. So, but that is inside the uterus, not inside the vagina. So th these are your tools. Your, your, you now have the knowledge that you need to take these words, take this kind of information, and use it to your best, to, to your best health and your best sex. If you don't have the tools and you don't have the words, you can't communicate to your partner what you want and need. And sex is a very important health factor. It keeps you happy. It keeps your brain happy. It keeps you well. There is nothing wrong with having sex with your partner. It is not a bad, dirty thing. It is, it is a wonderful thing. And you should change how you feel about it because this will really help you be healthier and happier all the way through your life. And no one has to stop having sex because of age. That's unless they don't have enough hormone, and then I'll take care of that at BioBalance, and we can give you your hormones back. But besides that, there's no good reason to stop having sex as you get older. Thank you for listening. Please come back next week. We'll continue our series on sexual health and orgasms. Email your questions or comments to podcast at biobalancehealth.com. You can find the BioBalance HealthCast on iTunes and on YouTube. For more information about bioidentical hormone pellet therapy and other reverse aging solutions, visit BioBalanceHealth.com or call 314-993-0963. You can find Dr. Maupin on Twitter at Dr. Kathy Maupin and on Facebook at Facebook.com slash BioBalanceHealth.